I had a, I almost had a bit of a mare today, Dan. So I finished work at oh, yeah. five o'clock. But also at five o'clock, our tickets for the Conference League went on sale, the group stage. All three games, all at the same time. And I had to try and buy the tickets individually for each game, one at a time. And then for the Alkmaar game, I was buying one for Dad as well. That was going to be sat next to me. Oh, my God. It was, it was just so stressful and, then, and chaotic. And how did it go? How did it go? Did you get them? Got them all. Got them all. So I'm in the lower okay, hole for, for the two games that I'm just going to. And then I've got, we're in the upper, the upper north then because trying to, we can't get tickets in the upper hole anymore. But I'll moan about that later. Very nice. Very nice. Well, at least you got them. Um, yes. And uh, any plans to go to any of the away games? Because I'm only a member. It depends whether the criteria yeah, yeah. it's highly unlikely, which is really gutting because yeah, yeah. a, tr- a trip well, to Poland my, my, would be nice. One of my biggest regrets as a Blues fan is that I didn't go to any of the away European games when, um, mm. in 2011. I went to all the home ones. I didn't get to go to any of the away games. Um, and it's kind of thing I wish I was like a few years older for it. You know, if I was like, you know, if it was like now or whatever, I'd have definitely been able to go. But um at least you've got tickets for the home game. It's very exciting. Yeah, and dad, dad, dad. When the uh, when we qualified, the day we qualified for the conference league, dad booked our accommodation for Athens. So whatever happens, we will be there when we get to the. You're getting a trip to Athens. Good yeah. one. Very nice. I would. I'm shaking my head, but you know what? I'd probably do the exact. Same. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, I'm Daniel Sketchler, and I'm Callum Byrne. We've been friends for more than 10 years, sharing lifelong passions such as film and music. But most importantly, football, through the ups and the downs, the celebration and the heartbreak. However, he's a blue nose. And he's a villain. This is the Second City Podcast. Hello, sir, then. We're back for week five, including last week's special episode. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It's it's weird to be back because we we kind of did the international break, but we also sort of had a week off in between as well. So yeah, it's a bit weird just how it's felt. Like we had a weird um. So like we did the McLeish episode because it was the international break. We didn't have to get it out like yeah on the weekend sort of, and then so we didn't really get it out until like the Monday or Tuesday. And that's normally when we record anyway for that week's episode. And so we ended up getting a bit like, um, we would have just had to have really squeezed it in last weekend. But we thought, you know, we got some midweek games this week as well. So we can sort of um, try and hopefully get away with it, record one tonight, and then hopefully get it out ahead of the next round of fixtures instead. Yeah, the game's come thick and fast for both of us now, really. <clears throat> mm. We went into the start of the season. Um, shall we start with uh, what we're wearing, Dan? Because we've got we're, yes. we're looking pretty similar tonight. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. Yeah, another you know for a club that uh, whose arch rivals wear blue, Villa do have a lot of blue kits. I must say, you seem to have quite a yeah. Uh, so so uh, what? It, well, it's Nike. It's a... mm, acorns. It's a, it's a nice it's all, era. an away kit. I'm gonna say 2000 and like. 12-ish. McLeish era? McLeish? No, no, not McLeish era, unfortunately. This is 2008-2009 away, oh. and then technically the 09-10 third. But it was really the away for 08-09. Any so, yeah. uh, great memories of that season? Yeah, I mean, um, the 08-09 season was... We had some really famous wins. We beat Ajax at Villa Park. I was there that night. Unbelievable night. Not that I remember a lot of it. I remember when Martin Larson scored, but that's about it. You know, we talked about not appreciating being in Europe when because you're just so young. Like, of course, like, yeah, like if we if we played Ajax now, it'd be like ridiculous. Yeah, incredible. Yeah. So, um, but no, I think, I'm pretty sure we got a win at the Emirates in this kit as well. Uh, we finished sixth under Martin O'Neill. Um, we watched the round of 32 of the UEFA Cup, but we probably should have done a bit better in that competition, but we just never took it seriously. So I'm pretty sure this is the shirt that we wore the last time we were in the group stage of the competition. And we wore this and we lost to Hamburg. 3-1. We played a bit of a joke team. Mm. But... We got to the round of 32, so we'd already qualified. So. Nice. 
But I thought it was Are a premiere, been... given that we're about to head into our first game back in the European group stage that I wore the shirt that was in our last game in the group stage. Very true. Fair enough. Uh, have you been? In, you've been in. So have you not been in Europe at all since? You must have had the odd season in those sense. So we had two playoffs in the two years afterwards, where we played uh, Rapid Vienna in both of them and lost both of them. And at the second, the second one at Villa Park before the game, they unfurled a banner in the away end that said, "Your nightmare returns." And then they beat us. So. And it, Rap- it, it would have been so... I, I assume they're not in the Europa Conference League this year, Rapid Vienna, because that would have been hilarious. They you know. almost qualified for it. They were very... They oh, were in okay. the playoff stage and, and they lost the playoff. So... Oh, that's a um, shame. That would have been hilarious. It's funny. We could have drawn Eintracht Frankfurt or Fiorentina. The one team we didn't want was Rapid Vienna. Rapid Vienna. <laughs> so Although in a way, in Vienna. Vienna. Yeah, an away, is- day, an away day in Vienna would have been, been pretty cool if you managed to... Uh, that would have been one upside. Nice. I'm wearing. Um, well, let me guess. Oh, let guess. me guess. Yeah. Me guess. I reckon. I feel like I recognise this one, but yeah, it's it's in. I think it's around that McLeish, very unique kit. Yeah, it's around that McLeish sort of era, isn't it? But then the sponsor, which I won't name, because mm. because it's a bit on yes. on the uh, on the mm. ropes. I'm going to guess it's got to be yeah. somewhere around like twelve, thirteen, maybe. Yeah, very close. This is 13, 14. This kid is 10 years old this season. Um, you're probably thinking of... Um, so the year McLeish came in, we also had a penguin kit this year. So, that yeah, this is kind of the classic blues penguin kit design. Yeah. But this is the Deodora one. Um, I So this kit is kind of... I thought I'd wear it one because it's 10 years old this year. I thought it'd be a cool mm. one to, to wear. Um, and it's also starting to... like The paint's kind of starting to peel on it and stuff. I thought I'd get on before it's like a complete mess <laughs> over. But um, uh, it's weird because I didn't buy a kit for the season before. And so when this season came around, I was like, oh, I'll buy one this year then. Yeah. Uh, I think I might have got it for Christmas even. Um, our away kit this season is genuinely maybe my least favourite Blues kit ever. I just cannot stand is it. The Bel- it. Is it the Belgium kit? No, I like the no. Belgium kit. Oh, that okay. came out a year later. No, it's like it's yellow with like black stripes on the mm-hmm. sleeves and stuff. But it's like it's kind of it's not just yellow. I, I like all our yellow kits. It's not yellow. It's like a limey green almost. It's like really disgusting. It's like not a nice kit at all. Um, so it was a no brainer that I was going to get this one. But I I, I like the penguin kits. I'm, I really wanted a penguin kit, so I quite I'm glad that I've got this one. But it's not as nice as the one we had in the McLeish season. That one just for some reason looked cleaner. It was, that was made by um, I think Umbro. That one is better, I think. I don't like the sponsor um, on this one. We only had them for one year, thankfully. And it was a dreadful season. So this is the year where Paul Caddis scored on, in the last minute to keep us up at Bolton. So we were in the away kit, annoyingly. So I do like I, I do like this kit, though. Um, but yeah, and it's just a no-brainer to get us ahead of the away one. I, I, I can't stand the away one. So yes, 2013-14 <laughs> home is what I'm wearing. Nice. Very nice. God, dear Dora, that's a throwback. I got a couple of dear Dora yeah, upstairs absolutely. as well. I wonder no, what they're up to I these days. Dear Dora. Yeah, tell me about it. Um, shall we get into um the games that were the weekend that was? Yeah. Do you want to start with Villa or Blues? Uh, well, so this is the first. Is this the first time this season we've kicked off at the same time at the weekend? Yeah, probably. It'll probably be the last time for the next few months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, I'd say let's start with Villa then. I feel like we started with Blues quite a bit in the last few weeks. Well, I mean, both games were a tale of late goals. Um, and yeah. For, for once, it's me smiling for both for both yes. sets of late goals. So, yeah, um, yeah Villa Park, uh, we played Crystal Palace. We won 3-1, um, which if you'd have told me in the 85th minute, I don't think many people would have believed you. So <laughs> I certainly would have done. Um, it looked like one of those classic games where we'd been the much better team, found a way to go behind and just couldn't score. And we, we just needed a moment of magic, which came from John Duran, his third goal of the season, his second in the Premier League. And it is an absolute belter. Absolutely it's fantastic a rocket, yeah. goal. Cancel the goal of the month competition. We have the winner. 
There it is. It was. It was some some smack, wasn't it? Yeah, it's funny because he almost scored a goal identical to that against Manchester City last year, but it hit the crossbar. And at the time, we were like, "Oh right. God, what a goal that would have been!" And so the fact that so to to kind of recreate it, but put it in the in the onion bag in front of the whole end mm. to get us back in the game. I mean, it's kind of what you can't ask for better than that, really. Um, no, absolutely. But yeah, um, we'd gone behind early in the early in the second half. We'd had a goal disallowed in the first half. We'd been, we'd been a much better team in the first half. Just missed a lot of chances. Ollie Watkins missed a one-on-one. Sam Johnston made a good save. Matty Cash lost his lost his touch slightly when it came to front of goal composure and missed a couple of chances. Um, but you know we went in nil-nil and it's like yeah we've been the better team. So we're just we're just missing the goal because we've been very very good. And then the second half, just like at Burnley, just let a silly goal in like straight away and all of a sudden we were on the back foot we were behind we were chasing the game and Crystal Palace you know they were out they didn't have um, Elise or Jefferson Lerma Mark Gahey uh, they didn't have Roy Hodgson either he was taken ill just before the game and so oh, like, that yeah so like that yeah. clinical striker Roy Hodgson <laughs> was out <laughs> <laughs> so no, I mean they were very they were just very depleted <laughs> Uh, Jordan Ayew yeah, went no, off no, no, no. early in the first half as well, which weirdly, I think, and they brought Mateta on and they went 4-4-2, which kind of worked against us because I think we had the measure of them when they had Ayew on the pitch. As whereas Mateta is one of those players that really likes to turn up against Aston Villa. Um, yeah. Like he scored against us last year and then he, he puts a, an absolute fantastic cross in for Otson Edward. Uh, and Emmy Martinez just slips really, and uh, it's an easy sort of tap in finish. Um, but yeah, we never really got going in the second half. We were a bit flat, and you know, they, there's that old saying subs change games. And we brought on Leon Bailey, John Duran, uh, Yuri Tielemans, and all, all of them had an impact. They were all really good when they came on. Um, Yuri Tielemans was pinging balls, slotting through balls through. Um, it was his through ball that got uh, effectively the third, the third goal, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, that set the third goal off, but it was also his through ball to Watkins that won the penalty as well. Okay. Um, so he was really impressive when he came on, you know, which I think was good for him given that he was making some comments in the Belgian media last week that he's not happy he's not playing a lot at the moment. So oh. you got to earn your place in the side when you play. And he's, you know, I didn't think he did much against Hibbs as well as he's actually making a stake to, to maybe play. Uh, on Thursday night now, so we'll see. Cool. Um, but yeah, I want to talk about the penalty, Dan, because you've seen the penalty now, haven't you? Yeah, so, I have. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Um, I wasn't too shocked it was given. It looked like he did, did take Watkins' legs out. That's what it looked like to me. Um, but I haven't seen it once. I feel like you're maybe. Um... Well. It's a, it's one of those where I feel like the best way to describe the whole situation is I'm going to use a cricket term here, umpire's call. So okay. when they are not too sure whether the batsman is in or out, the technology quite, can't quite a hundred percent definitively give you an answer. They just go with the on-field decision. Right. So you, uh, is your concern that it maybe wasn't in the box? No. So. Um, so when I first saw it on first viewing as the balls come in, I've gone, that's got to be a penalty. The ref points to the spot. And they're showing the replays. And it's so, the angles they've got, it's so hard to tell whether Chris Richards gets a touch on the ball before he takes Watkins. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, really touch, touch and go. Yeah. It's really I can touch see what and you go. Mean. And I, you can tell I'd only seen it once as well because he's a good, like, five yards inside the box before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's what you mean. I mean, this goes back to um, we referenced in our McLeish episode, and we tried not to get into it too much. But there was a famous, obviously, the famous Blues Villa game where yeah. at Villa Park, where you got James Milner scores the penalty, and yeah. the big debate was the penalty was given with like ten minutes to go, and Roger Johnson one hundred percent gets the ball, like <laughs> or otherwise, like he like one hundred percent gets the ball. Um, I mean, I'd have to watch it again. Yeah, but it sounds like a very sim- it was a very similar one where was he did he get the ball before the man or the man before the ball? I'd have to watch it again, but I well, remember it was I, it I was think, ropey from what I remember. 
and it's also this thing of like, I suppose we're in the VAR era now, but I suppose back then the referee was completely blindsided and had no way of knowing if he'd got a touch on the ball or not. But with this one, um, I suppose it's the debate as to whether, does, even if he does get a touch on the ball, is it enough to justify not giving a penalty? Yeah, and I, I want to give a lot of credit to the referee. I've forgotten who the referee was now, but I thought he did a very good job. He's got sent to the monitor within... He's so good. He's so good, I can't remember his name. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's good. We shouldn't know who the referees are. I feel like if a referee's doing a good job, you don't know who they no, are. No, true. Yeah, true, true. So, um, yeah, true. That's very true. So, maybe after about a minute or so of VAR checking, the referee goes to the monitor. Usually in the Premier League era of VAR, if the referee goes to the monitor, they look at it for 10 seconds and they change their mind. This didn't happen this time. The referee was at the monitor for a good five minutes, having, and you could see on the cameras he was having a debate with the VAR. I think the VAR was probably trying to convince him to overturn it, and he was, and he right. was probably saying, "Well, actually, has he got the ball? He's, has he got the man?" And you know, I, fair fair play to the referee. I mean, whatever. Obviously, the the decision's gone our way. Great, but I was actually, I hand on heart. At the same time, when I was watching it live, was saying whatever he does, I think he's done a good job because he's he hasn't just gone and just changed his mind. He's gone. He's had actually had a really good look at it. He's had a good debate with the VAR, and while the crowd's getting all hostile as well, he's actually kept his head. And whether or not they've come to an agreement that it is a penalty or not, he's gone with the, the very least umpire's call. There's not enough in it. It's not clear and obvious to overturn it. Whether if it, if he hadn't have given it, would they have given it? Probably not. So that's why I use the term. I think it was an umpire's call penalty decision. Cool. Um, that's fair enough, and it's good to get out of this habit as well. There was that point when referees would go over to the VAR monitor and the fans would start cheering yeah. when they saw him going over, and I hated that. That really bothered me. You knew something was wrong when when things like that happened. Yeah. Because it just defeated the point of him going to the monitor to make his own mind up. He was just going over to be like, oh, right, yeah, I'm wrong, cool. Let, let's do whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so, and yeah, so in, in the space of like n- no time at all, we'd gone from being dead set to lose the game to being 2-1 up. And then all of a sudden we've pretty much broken straight away from the kickoff. Gone and got a third, Leon Bailey. You know, a lot of players would have just hit it first time when the balls come across the box to him. Musa Diaby puts in a beautiful, beautiful cross. He was fantastic at the weekend. Um, and Leon Bailey takes a touch, places it. Nice. Three points. Well, have them. I love it. Sometimes that third goal is the most satisfying as well, even though it's not technically the winner. It's yeah. Because it's the one that, like, you know you've won at that point, you know, yeah. in, like, the 101st minute or something. Yeah, I think it's one of the latest ever Premier League goals to win a game or something. It's like ridiculous. Wow. So. But yeah, a, a, a really good three points because it's one of those games where, it, for many reasons, if we'd have lost the game, we'd have come away going, it's three points dropped. And you look at the table and like, oh, we've only, I don't know, it doesn't feel like we've had a good start to the season when it's been okay. Sure. As far as, you know, we look at the table now, nine points from five games. I'll take that. Take that every day of the week. So. Not bad at all. Not bad at all. And you're also winning um, your home games, getting big results in that sense. You know, yeah, good win against Everton the other week. Good win this week. Yeah, so it's 10 league wins in a row at Villa Park. Sorry, 10 wins in a row at Villa Park, nine of them in the league. So all of right. a sudden, and I think Unai Emery's, Unai Emery's, all the games he's managed at Villa Park since he came in, We've lost three, drawn one, and won the rest, which is wow. quite an insane record. It's like a seventy-three percent win percentage at home. I mean, Gosh. is that something he's been known for in like a lot of his jobs, like in Spain and stuff as well? Like, seems to ring a bell. Um, oh, well, of course, his European record as well is exactly... his European record isn't is as good as anyone's. So, mm. yeah. Well, so... interesting, interesting. I um. Didn't have such a good weekend with uh, in terms of football because no. obviously as your goals were going in, um, our goals were going in, but in the wrong end, sadly. Um, yeah. Another game though where you've had late goals again. It's sort of been like yeah, a defining like maybe not defining, but it's been like a statement of your it's season. A trend, yeah, yeah, it's a trend. Um, we uh, so first of all, I sadly I didn't go to the game. 
Um, although I am going to Norwich away in a few weeks. Oh, so, uh, I'll be a of all the away days to go to, the, probably the one of the furthest in the country. <laughs> but yeah, no, it should be good. But no, I didn't go, sadly. I did manage to catch most of the game on WM, although I then didn't... I had to miss the ending. So I <laughs> both, missed both the goals um, and the sending off. So uh, shout out, though, to um, a few people, including George from Block 11 uh, in the Tilton Road, who has uh, filled me in on everything. He went to the game, filled me in. Obviously, I've caught up on all the highlights and everything as well. Um, sounded like a really even game. Watford haven't started the season particularly well. I think their expectations are a bit lower this year. I did go to Watford away last year, as a side note, and we lost 3-0. Scott Hogan had maybe the worst miss I've ever seen. It was a night Kenan game. Davis scored. Keenan Davis scored. We were 1-0 down after about five minutes. We were 2-0 down after about 12. Um, our mate, Will, had loads of issues getting back on his train. Mm. We got there. Uh, we had to let Brace get to the ground on time. So it was a disaster. So <laughs> I, I just wasn't going to go this year. Um, <laughs> but anyway... Yeah, so the unbeaten run is over in the league. Um, but it did sound like a really even game for the most part. It sounded like we defended really well for a lot of it. And it looks on the highlights like we had some really good chances. Like Jay Stansfield hit the post with a wicked curling shot from outside the box in the second half. Scott Hogan had a wicked uh, double chance, which I think were, I think they're just two good saves from the keeper. Um, and... Ultimately, it looks like the game's coasting towards a draw. And then Lee Buchanan, who's our left back, who has been like absolutely excellent, has been sent off for two yellow cards. And the second one is just like, I'm not sure, what, I can't remember what the term is, but he's basically, his fans tried to get away from him and he's kind of just held him back a bit, basically. Oh, okay, yeah. Like professional foul, is that what they call yeah. it or something? Um, and so it's a yellow card. I, I'm not actually sure what the first one was for, I've not actually seen it. Um, but... George was telling me that actually being there, the scale of the refereeing performance was really strange because looking at the stats, both teams had about 16 or 17 fouls each. And I understand a foul can range from anything to like a leg break and tackle to pulling someone's shirt. You know, it's like a yeah. really... Um, but we had seven yellow cards. Watford had one. And that's for that was for dissent. And so it's quite a huge gulf. And when you've got players like so Cody Drama, who's Drama, Drama, who's just come in at fullback, he was booked in like the second minute or something. So that's a huge, you know, he's going to be. That's a really big problem when like you've got. A that must have, that must have to have been one heck play. of a bad foul to get a yellow in the second minute of a game. Yeah, you exactly. Think. Was it the second minute or it was like it was it, it was the second or like the, it was very yeah. early anyway. Um. And then you've got like Bielik and Sunjic getting on the yellow cards. Sunjic may as well start games on the yellow cards. He just gets booked <laughs> every single game. And when you've got these players on yellows, they can't... Players like them, they can't... They, that then affects their game, isn't it? Because they've got to be really careful and they're naturally really combative uh, players who are really, you know, full throttle. Um, so I think that maybe affected us as well. But it looks like we're coasting towards a draw and then... Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. Ray Rayovic, Ray Ray Rayovic. Um, and just to get on the end of the cross in the 91st minute, uh, beats Deion Sanderson to the ball, manages to get a loop and header over John Ruddy. So we're one 0 down in the 91st minute. That's a real shame. And then I'm assuming we've probably pressed for an equaliser. And in the 96th minute, I think it was, um, Andrew does a shot, and I think it deflects off Kevin Long, and. Wrong foot's ruddy, and so we're 2 0 down. So I don't look at it too much in that it was a 2 0 loss. I think we probably went 1 0 down really late. And we're pre- it's kind of similar to when we played Cardiff the other week and we're pressing for a, an equaliser and we end up letting one in on the other end. I'd imagine that's what has happened here. So it is this point of loss this game, but uh, chance people about this as well, and they're so right. We've been a little lucky the last few games. Like we didn't, we weren't particularly good against Millwall, and we still managed to get a draw out of it. We were probably the weakest team against Plymouth and we still won the game. You know, we were probably due one of these. This is, you know, maybe a bit of bad luck. We were probably due one. Um, And I think a lot of our injury problems are starting to show a bit now. Like we've got, um, like Dembele, like this week, like just so many players are out. Like Dembele is still out. Um, Laird, Ethan Laird is still out. Uh, Obviously, Jukovic was suspended. Um, Tyler Roberts is still out I don't think he's since the very first game uh, obviously Buchanan is suspended now for the next game 
So it's really like adding up now. This is quite a lot of... Uh, I think once we get all these players back and we've got our strongest team playing, I think we are going to be really, you know, really something. Um, but you've got to always accommodate for injuries. And I think it's just maybe getting through this phase at the minute. And hopefully, I don't... It's weird how clubs go through phases of either just never really having injuries or just having loads. Yeah. I don't really know if it's something going on in training or whatever, training methods. But um, it's a little concerning. But... Yeah, as I say, it was probably due one. Rode our luck a little bit the last couple of weeks. So, learn from it and move on, I guess. It was never going to last forever. Yeah, and near, near enough, really, isn't it? So, um, yeah, what did of you course. make of John, John Ruddy's performance? Because I, I was watching the highlights there. I thought he pr- probably could have done a little bit better for the first one. Yeah, it's... The second one's deflected, isn't it? So. Yeah, of course. Yeah, the second one is what it is. Like it, it, I don't think you could be blind to that one. The first one weirdly reminds me of the Brad Fried or uh, Ziggit <laughs> one slightly. Like he's kind of gone yeah. down, he sort of flapped at it. It's not as bad as the Fried one, but um, yeah, I think he could have done a bit better. I think he's gone at it too soon. He's kind of it looks like he's dived too soon. Is it is a hard header to save, even though it's not it's not traveling fast. It's looping and it is like the yeah. flight of the ball. I can understand that is is tough. Um, yeah, he's not been. Um, he's not been great like this season, in my opinion. I know it's not just my opinion. I think a few other people think that his kicking is really it's something that Neil Lethbridge is slated for is his distribution. But I don't think Ruddy's is much better. Um, he probably should have saved the free kick against Millwall in the last league game, and then in the Plymouth game, he was definitely responsible for. Uh, their goal where like he's basically parried the shot straight back out into the middle of the box and into the path of a Plymouth player who scored so yeah he's been a bit inconsistent but I feel like it's the first real spell he's had like this with us obviously he was linked with a move away Luton apparently were in for him in the summer in the summer so he's more than allowed He's, you know, he's definitely going to be granted some slack because he has been excellent for us and I think it's hopefully just a blip and um, certainly in no way does it to be dropped or anything. I think he's been a little out of form, but keep at it. I'm sure, I'm sure he'll get back to his usual uh, usual self soon. Yeah. Should we just do a little bit of housekeeping, Dan, before we preview the next couple of games? I've got a couple of notes here. Yeah, of course. Um, so just because obviously we were off, we were like off the air really in terms of the newsy sort of stuff for a couple of weeks. Um, in terms of in terms of Villa, um, Philippe Coutinho finally went out on loan. It's something you've been talking about all summer, Dan. You didn't know he was still there. Uh, has... Yeah, to he has finally Qatar, gone. Qatar. Yeah, he's gone to a Qatari side. Yeah, um, just for the season, um, they're going to cover his entire salary, which is something like 150 grand a week. Um, I think it, it's a it's a bit oh. of a disappointing one for us, but I think it could be a win win. Sure. Just because um, he obviously had that really good loan spell with us under under Steven Gerrard, and he found a bit of form, and then just couldn't stay fit last season, and even this season. Every time he's got himself fit, he's played a few games. We're all there, like always oh, looking good. He's looking good. He's injured again. So it'll either be the route towards a permanent way out for him. Or it means that he can have a full season. Yes, the quality of league is not very good, and I'm fully aware of that. But even though the quality of league is not quite as well, he can have a year just get himself match fit. He'll be playing games. He'll be the main man. He'll play 80 minutes every single week in Qatar. It's hot weather, so it's probably good for the hot weather training. Probably good, a good place in a lesser league to keep yourself in shape. And then that means, hopefully, that next summer, if you know, he'll be fit and it will either sell him, loan him out again, or he'll be able to slot in to our squad quite nicely. So I'll have to see, really. I think that's why cool. we probably didn't sell him. But yeah, that's my thoughts on the Coutinho thing. Um, the other thing I had was there was a bit of news around your stadium, which is still not fully rebuilt. Is that how you'd phrase it? No. Fixed. Yeah, when you go, so like some of the safe standards have been put in. Do you know what it's like? It says the Blues in Brighton yeah. uh, in, in the in the seats. So like they've done like the first 
like a couple of letters, like the blur is there now. So they need to finish that and then all of the, the cop side as well. Yeah, so y- the company that you had who were doing it went into administration. They were also doing Anfield as well. And there was videos of them like in the middle of the day just clearing out of the site because the company had gone bust. But you do have a new company now, Dan, who's going to finish fixing your stadium. Yes, they're called uh, Mace. Uh, to be honest, I know very little about them, but the most important thing is that apparently work resumed on it uh, last Monday. So, uh, yeah, September 11th, they resumed work on it at 9 a.m. Very specific, I think is what they said. Uh, the good news is they said it should all be done by November, end of November this year. And the capacity will be back up to near 30,000 when it's the case. Um, so that's good news. That's not long, yeah. you know, finally, considering they found these structural problems in December 2020, <laughs> it have taken them <laughs> three years to get there, just shy of three years, but, but whatever. Including, doing, including a fun. whole season where there was nobody in the stadium. Yes, it's almost like that would have been the perfect time to have done it, really. But, yeah. um, but I understand that, you know, we've got some proper people in now sorting it. Uh, so, yeah, so that is some good news. Um. I had some other Blues news this week. I don't know if you had any Villa news you wanted to get in first. Anything else? Um, well, I wanted to just have a little rant about the terrace view, which is... Go, go for it, go for it. So there was... We've got this new hospitality thing called the terrace view, a bit corporate but basically the idea of it was they did... The club did um, a survey for whole end season ticket holders at the back end of last year. And season ticket holders talked about things they liked, things they didn't like, things they wanted improving. And one of the things they wanted improving was the facilities. So the club completely misinterpreted the survey or had no intention of really following through with it um, and created this thing called the Terrace View. So it's on the top level of like the whole. If you were walking outside the stadium, you go up the steps and it's on that level. It's like, it's a really nice hospitality zone where but it's not like corporate hospitality. The idea is, is it's like a 20 quid per game bolt on for your season ticket. And it gives you access right. then to like a nice pre-match area where you can have a few pints and what have you. However, they then all of a sudden launched the like the terrace view season ticket. And so I as a member, I got offered this season ticket, um, it, but at hospitality price. So it was 1500 quid for the season. To sit Damn. in the to sit in the upper hole, and, <laughs> and use this new like pre match zone. So I mean, I'm it's at least it's not far off double the price of just a standard whole end season ticket. Yeah, um, there's been a lot of for about it, and there's rumours that it might have given a few extra perks on maybe like away tickets here and there, but some of it's rubbish and some of it isn't. Um, the annoying thing for me. Is is you know, am I a little you know, I had the opportunity theoretically to jump the season ticket waiting list because we've got, as it's well reported, a thirty thousand person waiting list. It doesn't mean that thirty thousand people would take up a season ticket if they were offered one, but it doesn't matter. So I'm ne- relatively near the front of that queue now because I was very early on the waiting list, so I'm near the front of that queue. So I didn't see the need to take myself off the waiting list to pay fifteen hundred quid a year to go and watch the Villa. No. Um, but the problem is, is because they've made this hospitality season ticket thing to sit in the upper hole, they've taken away a huge chunk of tickets out of the upper hole. And so you can buy a Terrace View package for the, as a one-off for the game. So say the um, Alkmaar game that's coming up or Brighton or whatever, you could buy a Terrace View ticket just for that day as a member and you get to use the facility and you'll sit in the upper hole. But you're play, paying an inflated price. Yeah, so of course. The Conference League playoff, I paid 30 quid for my ticket. A season ticket holder in the Terrace View, who because you don't get cup games on your season ticket, had to buy, obviously have to buy your ticket, had to pay £90 for his own seat in the Terrace View. It's just a complete That's disaster. Great. And it means now that I can't go and sit in the upper hole now. Which, you know, even as a member, I never had issues buying two tickets in the upper hole. You know, the stadium would sell out, but I'd always get a ticket in the upper hole. I can't do that now. So 
which is a real shame. So I've got to find somewhere else in the ground ready to go and sit. But, you know, you want to be in the atmosphere. And it's just a bit sad, really, and a bit disappointing. Of it is disappointing because we're, we're talking more and more about, in general, how football is becoming so unaffordable. You know, like, the cost of everything's going up, uh, including football. It's something which people should have access to and I've been priced out of. And this is just a kind of... They've kind of snuck through. They've used... You're saying it was like a survey and whatever, and they've kind of used it as maybe as an excuse, it sounds like, to do something like this. Yeah. And it's, it's a bit divisive in the fan base. And look, if I had 1,500 quid... I'd have gone and bought the season ticket. And like anyone who went and bought or pays for the territory, I ain't got a problem with that. I really don't. And it's mm. fair play. If you've got that money to spend, you can spend your money however you want. I haven't got a problem with yeah. that. It's just a shame that I can't now go and sit in the upper hole unless I pay for a hospitality package that I've never had to do before. And that's just a shame, really. Yeah, that's bizarre. Problems yeah. we don't have our blues yet. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 First world problems, and, you know. First world problems, but valid ones, valid ones for sure. Um, yeah, uh, the last bit of blues news to get into really, didn't want to touch on it too much, even though it probably sounds like some big news, but there's obviously been a few rumours lately um, about potential managerial swap. I, I was going to ask, I, I, I almost was going to bring this up because I'd been hearing a few rumours as well. So Yes. Um, yeah, so the big rumour is that apparently... Michael Beal at Rangers, Glasgow Rangers, is under a bit of pressure. And apparently they're looking at John Eustace to replace him, potentially, uh, at Blues. And the big rumour, obviously, is that a potential replacement could be, potentially, Wayne, potentially, Rooney. Uh, the Wayne Rooney. Um, so, I think Wayne Rooney's done... Pretty well as a manager so far, or at least uh, uh, maybe not pretty well, but he's at least not damn. He's not done anything bad in my opinion. The Derby thing was completely, you know, out of his hands. I think he did fairly well in the circumstance, um, and obviously he's winging their way into like top job. I think he's he's at least playing his trade a bit more. Um, so I wouldn't be too upset with that if it happened but I just don't think it's gonna is the reason I'm kind of this is why we have a few rumours that Eustace has turned down other jobs before and he's not at Blues apparently he's very happy at Blues he lives in the area his family live in the area I know Rangers is a massive club but I just don't I just don't see it happening I wouldn't be shocked if there's something in it like we've had new American owners come in and then we have one of the most famous English players ever, who obviously has connections to soccer, as, as they call it in the States. You can kind of put two and two together and you can kind of see how that might happen. Um, I, I think it's very common. It it's very common when you get new owners that the manager changes. And maybe not straight away, but it's very common that when you get a new owner that early on you can end up with a new manager. It happened with us. It happened at Newcastle. There's there's countless examples um, of clubs that they get yeah. a new owner in, and they either change the manager straight away, or you'll end up where the new manager has a few games, and then as soon as you hit a bit of a blip, they're gone. And we're also seeing this trend of new owners, especially yeah. some of the American owners, coming in and wanting like a sexy name manager to come in and not necessarily the best manager for the job. And the Wayne Rooney, way. Wayne Rooney screams sexy. Wayne Rooney screams <laughs> sexy as well. So I'm sure that's what they're after. <laughs> so yeah, no, but I completely agree. And even not just, uh, you know, owners from America. Like, I mean, there was a big rumor that Thierry Henry was going to become your manager at one point. Obviously when, uh, when blues were bought in 2016, within like a day, jean goes Zola. Oh no, well, within a month or so, Zola, oh, yeah. manager, a man who's completely unqualified for the job. Um, so yeah, so it, yeah, we'll be shocked if something like it happens eventually, but I just don't see it happening anytime soon. And I don't see Eustace, I personally don't see Eustace wanting to take a job in Glasgow, uh, not because it's Glasgow, but I just don't see him like, <laughs> I don't see him, you know, he seems very happy where he is. I just don't. What is it with Rangers as well? Just like having this weird like yeah. manager pool in the Midlands all of a sudden. <laughs> like you had the cool. Gerard Gerard Villa, Beale was at Villa, and 
Wolves wanted him, yeah, and then he ended up in Rangers. And, oh, it's really bizarre as well because Bill, I think, was with Eustace at QPR, wasn't he? Uh, no, Eustace was. was well? No, Eustace was your manager at that point. Oh, was he? It's my. Yeah. Oh, he was. It's only, yeah. it's only a year ago. Weird, man. These last... Oh, it's weird. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah, Eustace was our manager. These, these last few seasons have just like blur. I feel like we've had an extra season. Like <laughs> it just is all blurred into one of it. Um, so yeah, they're my thoughts on on that. Shall we do a really quick preview of the the matches that we got coming up? Yeah, yeah. Um, should we start with? Should we go chronologically? Yeah, yeah. We'll start with with you because you play tomorrow, today, whenever this gets released. Tomorrow, as we speak. <laughs> yeah, so we're recording this tomorrow as we speak. We're recording this on Monday. We're playing Preston on Tuesday. The game's live on Sky Sports Arena. For anyone who didn't know. So, and the red um, you can watch the game live on there. The red button on Sky Sports. And the red button, yeah. Um, yeah, of course. So, um, won't go into too much detail on it because by the time this podcast is out, the game, and by the time anyone's listening, the game's probably been played already. It's going to be a really tough game, though. They're liter- they are top. They're top of the league. I think they're unbeaten. Them and Leicester, I think, are, are unbeaten. So, it's going to be a really hard game. So, I won't be too disheartened if we lose. Um, is it Ryan Lowe who's the manager there now? Uh, he's done a really good job. I don't think too many people were shouting too much about Preston before the season started, but yeah, deep down on a night game, could be a really tough game. So almost feels like a free hit, honestly. Um, a draw would be a terrific result. Doesn't look like we're going to have too many players back from injury. Jukovic's still going to be suspended. Buchanan's suspended, so both our fullbacks are probably going to be out. So because um, Laird, I don't see being back. So going to be tough. Um, so I'm not too, you know, to free hit. Hopefully you're going to just enjoy watching the game rather than getting too stressed about it. And instead, we'll look ahead to, I'm kind of more focusing on our weekend game. Uh, but before that, you've got the return to Europe on Thursday. Yes, so we have Legia Warsaw uh, away from home, which is on Thursday, uh, quarter to eight, and that's on TNT Sport if you want to watch it. Qu- quarter six, quarter six, right? Is it quarter six? Have I got the time wrong? <laughs> I'm sure it's quarter six, yeah. Oh, yeah, maybe. I know that I've got a. I, I, it's really touch and go for me to get home in time to watch. Yeah, sorry, it's a quarter six. Yeah. Yes, so I'm in. I uh, I'm probably I'm in a really tricky situation because. <laughs> this is bad news. This is bad news because that's the day that I've got to get. I've got to get. I've got to be a commuter. It take. I'll finish at five, and it takes me like two hours to get home. So. Oh, find somewhere right. to watch it. I'll find a bar or something. To yeah, watch I, might have to, I might have to do that. That's not ideal. Yeah. Anyway, that's my problem. So, yeah, um, Legia Warsaw, really, really, it probably is a tough opening away at Poland, in Poland to start off the group stage. Um, should we win? Probably, but they are top of the league in Poland at the moment. Um, it's going to be, I, do, I would expect a hostile atmosphere, you know, that the, those European fans have a reputation for being loud. And, oh, yeah. um, and I, I, I fully expect if we play our game and stay relatively calm, we'll have the quality to win the game. We should be really favourites, I guess, to top the group. So, But we can't, it, you know, the away games have all got potential banana skin written all over them. Um, and so if we can go out there and, and, you know, if we can win the game, fantastic. If we have, if we can only take a point, let's take a point and and move on, really. Because yeah, I, I back us in all the games at Villa Park, so you know, theoretically, then it just means as long as we don't make a mess of the away games, um, we should be okay. So yeah, it'd be tough, it'd be interesting, but exciting as well. I'm re- I'm really buzzing for it. Oh, so do you think you'll make many changes? Or? No, I don't. There'll be a couple of changes in there, but I think we're we're going to take this. Well, until we are through the group stage, we're going to take this competition very seriously, and we would be very, very, very stupid to not do that. Yeah, I completely agree. I think uh, when I saw who you'd drawn in the group, I think this one was like the kind of standout team you'd be playing. If you know what I mean, it seemed like the most exciting sort of. Um, so yeah, big night for you on Thursday. Yeah, massive. Um, you've got a big. You're on telly again on Friday as well. Yeah. You've got a. You've got probably a bigger game than the Preston one. You got struggling yeah. again QPR. Yeah. So um, 
Yeah, we're on Sky twice in three days. It's pretty unusual for us. But uh, yeah, so we've got QPR at home and it's the Friday night game. And it's at home against QPR who are 20th. They've had a, they had a really, they've had a really awful 2023. They've been dreadful. Um, three defenses. They beat Middlesbrough the other well. week. Yeah, they did. Did they beat Middlesbrough recently? But other than yeah, that, but they're bottom of the league, aren't they? So <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I don't know what's happened to them. But this is mental. So we played QPR in the Friday night game almost exactly a year ago, uh, and they were top at the time. <laughs> um, With Michael Beale. Michael Beale was there as their manager. <laughs> yeah, uh, they were they were top of the league, and we beat them two 0 uh, Longello scored, and I can't remember who got the other one. But um, oh, that's really annoying. I think oh, it will come to me. But that was one of the best, apart from maybe the West Brom home game, that was the best game of, home game of the season. It was absolutely rocking. I love a good Friday night game under the lights. Just got a completely different energy. I don't know what it is. Even when a half our stadium's crocked, it's like <laughs> there's just something different about it. So I'm really glad that, you know, we've got, like, we got this and West Brom again at home in a few weeks as well on the Friday night game. So that's really exciting. Um, and yeah, they've been so poor. It, it's mental that there was, top when we played them in this fixture last year at home and they're 20th now they were very fortunate to stay up last season kind of surprised Gareth Ainsworth's still there someone who I do like but seems to have just not got it right there at all yet Um, but they are capable of having a result in them I think they started the season really terribly had a few bad results but they have won one or two games Um, so don't write them off but I think even with our injuries and all this going on I still think we should be beating them you know, all day long, we should definitely have too much for them. I'm hoping it'll be a really electric atmosphere. So, yeah, honestly, if we lost to Preston but we beat QPR, I'm fine with that. Three points for them, two games, that'd be good. Nice. And then you're back in action against um, Premier League strugglers, relegation fodder. <laughs> um, the whipping boy is the Premier League, uh, Chelsea, at the weekend. <laughs> Away from home, the Sunday two o'clocks are well and truly. Uh, in the oh, calendar back. now, yeah. back. We're not on television mm. again because it, for some reason the North London derby is on at two o'clock on Sunday, and Sheffield United Newcastle is on at half four. And so, you know, we so are... we're, we're, you know, we're sorry, we're recording this. Do you know what the Monday night football game that's live on TV now is? Yeah, it's Burnley Forest. Yeah. <laughs> who? Who? Well, who cares? Like, why would you broadcast that? Like, just what a bizarre game to show. I'm not saying you've got to show all the top six teams all the time, but Forest v Burnley, what? Like, I don't know. Thomas anyway, Frank, sorry, carry as well. What, weird. Um, oh, but yeah, um, yeah, Chelsea aren't great. They were they they were missing chances left, right, and centre on Sunday against Bournemouth. So um, we went and won at Stamford Bridge mm. in like February or March last last year. Graham Potter's last game, I think it was. Um, so yeah, I mean we're going to be full of, full of confidence going to there. Hopefully we're not too leggy because uh, obviously we'd have gone to and from Poland uh, in the middle of the week. So yeah, I mean it's a tricky one because it's Chelsea, and so even though they're rubbish and they are rubbish, mm. it's still you know if we yeah it's yeah. It's not, it's not a given that we'll go there and, and beat them, you know, even though they're no, there's still that slight rubbish. Yeah, I mean, we were saying Conor Gallagher was their captain at the way. Yeah. Have, have they spent all that money in their squad is still just a, like a mess. Like, I just don't get it at all. Yeah, well, they disassembled a Champions League winning squad and have just built a mid table one. It's. Yeah. Yeah. Bizarre, but they've got a lot of players out injured, so um, you know, it looks like Kaiseido's injured, and there's a few others as well. Lavia, Chucklemaker. So, yeah, but uh, I expect us to, to go there and give them a good game. I think, weirdly, we're going to be the favourites going into that game. Um, mm. So, I mean, we've started the season, our away form has been a little bit rocky, so we've had the two quite heavy defeats in the Premier League. We did win it at Hibs. So, if we got two away wins this week, I think that'd be massive for us. Um, men- Mentality-wise, I think it'd be absolutely huge. And they're two big games and two tough games. So it'd be a good test of our of our mentality and the way that may have just shifted a little bit at the start of the season. And I think if we were to win both these games, that really gets the ball rolling on our season now. Cool. 
So if you had to say prediction for both filler games, what do you think this week? I think we'll win 2-0 in Poland and draw 1-1 at Stamford Bridge. Interesting. Which would be really, really which would be a shame because Chelsea don't score goals. But <laughs> no, yeah, you'd have to probably stick one in your own net for that to happen. But um uh interesting though, I'm gonna say I I'm gonna be absolutely honest with the Preston one. I think they'll probably be us two one, but I don't think that's the end of the world. I think if we get anything from it, that'd be great. That's not me being a pessimist to be fair. I think that's just <laughs> I think that's fair enough. Uh, and I think we'll beat QPR 2 0 again. And I think that'll be hopefully Touchwood a really good game. So, yeah, that's my prediction for that one. Nice. Cool. Shall we um, shall we call it a day there, Carl? Sounds a good one to me. Pleasure as cool, always. Cool. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. As always, we'll be back next week to review all these games and then look ahead to the next round of fixtures, um, yeah. obviously. And uh, we'll leave you as we always do. If you have enjoyed today's podcast please do subscribe on whichever podcasting platform you're listening on and whilst you're at it uh go back and listen to our previous episodes if you'd like especially we did a special on when alex mcleish rocked the second city last week and when he did his controversial move from blues to villa in 2011 so we did a special episode on that just talking about looking back on that and his impact on both clubs and so on yeah it's a really really good episode i think and we would both highly recommend you go and give that one a a good listen as well. Um, also, go leave us a five star review on whatever podcasting platform you're you're on. Le- write a review even as well. You you know subscribe, write a review. Yeah, we'd love that. And uh, you can also follow us on Twitter or X, um, TikTok, and YouTube. Yeah, and you can find us with the handle at Second City Pod. That's like at Second City Pod. So at Two ND City Pod. Yeah. And everything's in our link tree. If you go, if you go to our Twitter, you'll find the link to a link tree. You'll have everything you could possibly want. That's about it, really. Yeah, beautiful. That was uh, yeah. Enjoyed that, Carl. Thank you, mate. Yeah, it might be a bit of a bumper episode this week, but we had a lot to yeah, pack in the last a, couple a, of weeks. A lot, yeah, a lot to catch up on. And what's happening in the next week? So I'll catch you next week, Dan. See you later. No worries, Carl. See you around, Carl.